So I'm pleasantly surprised that we've got a pretty full house here. So anyway, I really am happy to see everyone here. Uh, my name's Rebecca. And uh, most of you will know me as the person that normally does announcements, and you might see me in the, the lobby at the I'm News Station. I'm, I have a position here on staff uh, as a connections coordinator. Um, but I also am a member of the missions team here at the church. And um, I've been on that team for several years now, and it's, it's pretty awesome. And as a team, we... Uh, we try to highlight the work of international workers through the, the Alliance and the work that they're doing uh, across the world. And we also try to uh, encourage international st workers to come and share with us. And we also organize and um, sort of oversee short-term missions trips. And we also do missions-related content to kids and youth groups. So it's pretty awesome uh, what we do here for missions at MAC. Now, I was asked by Pastor Chris to do a message um, in this fake news series, and I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, you know, I'm, it's a stretch for sure, but I'm really excited, and it's my privilege to be sharing on a topic uh, so closely knit with missions. So you hear the term fake news. I just love that fake news. I, you know, you hear it so often in the news, often, it's sort of coined by President Donald Trump. And, um, you know, you can just sort of see him and hear him saying fake news. And it's usually when he's accusing, you know, whether it's TV reporters or uh, different news agencies, even TV networks, about reporting the news in an inaccurate fashion, in his opinion, right? So um, whether you agree with him or not, you know, some do, some don't, I think we can all agree that there is a lot of media out there, a lot of information, and a lot of opinions and um, especially with the emergence of the 24-hour news cycle and the internet and social media, I mean, it's just, you can just be overloaded with content. And, you know, especially with, the, with social media, everyone can have a voice and everyone can go public with their opinion. So how do you know what's true? Not too long ago, the news headline was pretty trusted. You know, I think, too, about movies or TV shows where you had the the young, usually a young man selling newspapers, like, get your newspaper here, read all about it. And everyone would flock to get their newspaper to see what was happening in the world, right? They would find out who won an election or uh, if the war was over or, you know, whatever the major news headline was, they went and found their news there and they believed it. So now when you look at the newspapers, you know, you might be at a convenience store and there's a you know, variety of different newspapers and you'll see a lot of different stories, but even the same story is reported in very different ways depending on the newspaper. You know, you might have, <laughs> even the images that they use to report uh, the story really varies depending on the newspaper. If you're looking at a liberal-leaning newspaper, you know, the, the picture of the conservative guy, he always looks bad. And then the conservative-leaning newspaper, you know, they're not making the liberal leader look too good. So, so what do we believe? There's, there's a different slant depending on, on the... Uh, where the news is coming from. And as I mentioned with social media, you know, there's so many topics debated online. Um, even articles that, you know, related to science and health. I think about information about vaccines, climate change, politics, you know, should you co-sleep or not, homeschool versus public school, organic food, keto diet, be, uh, you know, real beef versus beyond meat, like, ah! what do I do? You know, is it, it's tiring and overwhelming to know what is truth. And I don't want to be a skeptic and not believe anything. And I don't want to be gullible and believe everything. So where's that middle ground? So this series, Fake News, we've been tackling the subject of the end times, the apocalypse. And Barry reminded us last week that we must place our trust in the Word of God because we are going to be fed a lot of different information, a lot of different predictions, and... We need to uh, stand on the, the solid rock of the word to know what's true. And even with that, we need to be reminded that there's going to be some healthy disagreement amongst Christians on how they interpret the word about in regards to end times. And we also need to remain comfortable that there's going to be some unknowns and some details that we are not going to know in advance. So let's look at Barry's summary points from last week as he spoke about the return of Christ. So the first point was that Jesus did promise to come again. Do you believe it? Are you looking forward to it? 
Barry reminded us to not sweat the details, that we don't know all the details, and if we spend all of our time worrying about the details, then we're probably going to miss the big picture. Are you weighed down worrying about the details? Am I ready for the return of the King? Have I acknowledged Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior? Am I, uh, am I concentrating on doing his work on earth rather than fretting about the details? So today we're going to be wrapping up this fake news series, and we're going to take a closer look at how the gospel being shared to the ends of the earth is a prerequisite that has to happen before the end. So we're going to start in Matthew 24, 14. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So if we look at this verse, you can see three major themes of the New Testament in one verse. The first being the gospel, you know, the good news that Jesus came as man, died on the cross, was resurrected, and we are free. Um, we are redeemed uh, by that, by the cross and his resurrection. And that the kingdom will be preached throughout the world. So that's the Great Commission, that we are to go and share this good news with others. And then we wrap it up with, and then the end will come. Then, you know, Jesus will return. But those things have to happen first. So let's just, I want to give you a little bit of context of this verse um, to sort of to, to get it. So it's Matthew 24, 14, and it's sort of stuck in between um, this discourse of Matthew, uh, Matthew 23 through 25, which they call the Olivet Discourse which is also known as the little apocalypse because there's so much of this apocalyptic language of what has to happen, what to watch for before the end will come. And what I like about this passage is that when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he's not just telling them the signs. He's not just um, saying, watch for these exact details. He's, he's telling them how to live their lives. And I think we have to remember that often, is that the word of God is not just merely to inform us, but it, it's really there to transform us. So Matthew 23 um, centers on Jesus talking to his disciples about religious leaders and the Pharisees, which were the interpreters of the law. And he's basically not mincing his words and just calling them out for being hypocrites, saying, you know, they're fake, don't you know, listen to what they say, but don't follow their examples. You know, they might tithe perfect, perfectly and follow the rules and wear the right clothes and do the right things, but their inside doesn't match their outside. And uh, so maybe listen to their words, but don't, don't do what they do. And he also called them out for avoiding the most important aspects of the law, which are justice, mercy, and faith. So Jesus just said, like, don't live like this. And then he, we move into chapter 24, and um, Jesus is with his disciples, and they're spending time together, and they're, they're leaving the temple grounds, and the disciples are sort of pointing out the temple buildings. And uh, Jesus says to them, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. So when he's saying that the, the buildings are going to be demolished, he's saying that there will be a time where all that you see here is gone. The end is going to come. And I'm sure the disciples were thinking, like, okay, like, that's a little bit scary. Um, so later on, when it's quiet and they're just alone with him, they say to, him, to Jesus, you know, who's their friend, their mentor, their teacher, they say, like, what should we be looking for here, um, teacher? Um, give me a sign. Like, what, what's, what's going to happen before you return? And we've already covered a lot through the series of, you know, sort of between Matthew 4 and 13. Um, you know, through the summer we've talked about some of the dark stuff that has to happen before the end. Uh, false prophets, wars, threats of war, famines, earthquakes, persecution of Christians, you know, sin running rampant. But at the end, Jesus says, but, you know, one of the big buts of the Bible, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And that's when he proceeds to say... And the good, good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So even through the dark stuff, I'm still building my kingdom. And that's my first point. God is building his kingdom. This gospel, he's not saying in this verse that the gospel should be preached. Or not, it might be preached. He's saying it will be preached. He's saying this with confidence. And, you know, it's, it's a sovereign God saying these words, so we can take faith that the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth, and he is building his kingdom. And you can see examples of this happening. 
Um, it might not be covered in mainstream media every day, but the way the church is growing in Asia, you know, in South Korea, um, in China, the growth of the underground church movement, the house church movement, uh, just tens of thousands of people coming to Christ d despite oppression, despite persecution. And um, actually, uh, one year we were in Cuba on a family trip, and we ran into a couple of pastors, uh, Inuit pastors from Iqaluit, Nunavut. And it was sort of cool to get to know them and sort of meet, and they said, oh, there's an amazing move of the Holy Spirit across Nunavut. If only you could see we're so frustrated that you don't see it in the news, but there's this amazing move of the Spirit. So even in northern Canada, it's, you know, the, the word of uh, the Lord is being preached and being shared. So we close our service every Sunday saying the Lord's Prayer because Jesus said that the Father knows exactly what we need before we even say the words. And he instructed us to pray like that, like the, like the Lord's Prayer. So by telling us this, we're, ins we're instructed to pray for the kingdom to come. And the coming kingdom is, should be our burden, the burden of God's people. We should be asking, thy kingdom come. We want your kingdom to come. So I used to think that kingdom come meant the end of the earth, but let's, let's see what Jesus says about it in Luke 17, 20, 21. So one day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. So what's Jesus talking about? He's talking about God's reign and rule over our lives, not a future display of his power. So when we pray our kingdom come, you could also say, may all nations, all people on earth know you as king, Lord. Know, see you as king. May everyone on earth know you and do your will. So we should be excited, full of hope for his return, yes, and watching for the signs, yes, but our focus should be on sharing the gospel and he will build his kingdom. And we're, we're, our, we're called to share the good news. So God does not ask any of us to build his kingdom for him. He asks us to pray for his kingdom to come and to also seek his kingdom, to seek Jesus. But Jesus will be the one to build his church and his kingdom on earth. So if he's doing the hard work, he's going to build his kingdom, why does he need us? What are, we, what are we supposed to do? Well, you are part of his plan. I am part of his plan, and you are part of his plan to build his kingdom here. He wants to use us to further his kingdom and share the good news. Uh, let's look at the scripture of Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Uh, where we learn, where, where he, he commands us to do this. So then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he's, what's he saying? He's saying go, right? He's, if I had to wrap that up into one word, it would be to go. And he'll be with you when you go. And it should be noted here, we talk a lot about nations, and we talk, preach to every nation, and nation is not country, as we would see countries today. Nation... Uh, would mean every ethnic or people group. And in the time of the disciples, to go um, maybe looks a little bit different than what it looks like today to go and make disciples. The disciples travel to different towns, and they would preach the gospel in public squares, they would preach in people's homes, and they would also um, speak in religious squares. Today, um, going and making disciples could look like a large revival meeting. You know, think about, um, uh, think about Billy Graham. Tens of thousands of people would flock to go and see him preach the good news all across the world. And th those revival meetings are, are happening like crazy through Asia and Africa still to this day. You can think about um, international workers or missionaries going and living permanently in another country to go and spread the good news. We talked earlier about short-term missions trips, people coming from 
well, used to be the West going other places. Now, I mean, they're sending uh, missions teams to Canada and the States. <laughs> but uh, to go all also personally sharing your testimony and just talking to people around you about how Jesus has worked in your life. Uh, discipling, teaching others to walk with God and practically showing the love of Christ. And that can look like a lot of things. That can be helping someone with a practical need. That can be stopping in the grocery store when you're in a rush and someone wants to talk to you. Who's been there? Um, You know, there's just so many times where you're just in your own world and you don't want to stop for the person in front of you. You know, you've got your own plans. So he wants to use you as, and he wants you to go and be a, a witness for him, even in the grocery store. And we as a local church have a role to play in this plan. Um, A reminder that the local church is the people in this building. So the local church could meet in a building like we do. They could meet in a home. They could meet in a field. But the local church, a group of believers, has always been at the core of God's plan for building his kingdom here on earth. At MAC, that's why we celebrate guests. That's why we want to be more invitational. Why we love our community and why we want to reach out beyond the walls of this building because we care about this message of going and sharing the love of Christ. Um, And as believers, we should want to build authentic relationships with people with no agenda other than loving them to bring the kingdom to them. If they feel, if an unbeliever feels that you have an agenda of trying to convert them, they are not going to be warm to that. They just want to feel the love of Christ. They won't even know it's the love of Christ necessarily uh, initially, but that should be our only agenda. Um, And we can do all of these things when we trust God and trust that he's in control. And we always have to remember as we go that he is the one that's building his kingdom and we just need to submit to his plan. So I've talked about a few different ways that we can go and make disciples. However, it wasn't too long ago that it seemed impossible for the gospel to actually reach the ends of the earth using regular means, you know, like even newspapers or even the telephone. Or it, How would that even be possible to reach the ends of the earth? Well, many aspects of today's global society would have been unimaginable only a few decades ago. So we've gone through the digital revolution. And Wikipedia defines the digital revolution as the shift from mechanical and analog technology to digital electronics. So that sort of started in the 50s through the 70s, and the term also implicitly refers to the move towards digital computing and communications technology. So, big words, blah, blah, blah. The internet, computers, we can reach people a lot more efficiently and quickly with the use of technology. Um, Never before in history of the world have we had the capacity to preach the gospel as we do today. Um, Like I mentioned, the internet, cell phones, travel is far easier than it used to be. Uh, Language is less and less of a barrier with uh, computers being able to translate things just on the spot. Um, And even in in developing countries, a lot of people have access to a smartphone. You know, there are lots of um, other resources they might not have, but there are a lot of cell phones in most countries where you go, right? If you're going to have anything, it's going to be the cell phone. So it sounds easy, right? Now we just need to, you know, put something online and everyone should know about it. But it's not quite that easy. And how have we as Christians gone so wrong over and over again in trying to carry out the Great Commission? Um, I think about the Crusades where... You know, Christians went with force to try to convert people groups. And I think about residential schools in Canada, and I think about signs where uh, people will pick it and tell people they're going to burn in hell. These strategies are not too effective in uh, sharing the love of Christ. And they might actually create obstacles um, to the gospel being shared in these areas. I was speaking with Lisette Lavoie, who's an international worker in Guinea, Uh, last time she was home, and she said a lot of her work is breaking down barriers with the people of Guinea, who still, in their recent history, the Crusades, um, you know, happened in Guinea, and they don't trust Christians. They just, you know, there's a lot of fear and a lot of, that she needs to break down with love and a holistic um, missions approach. So this brings me to my last point. 
you can't go alone. So we're to go. And the great commission tells us to go preach the preach the word throughout the nations, but you can't go alone. As I've mentioned, we have a tendency to mess things up. We make wrong decisions. We take the wrong path on our own, don't we? And we can really hurt one another. You know, just think about your own personal life, how often we can hurt one another. In our own strength, we will not do this well. We will not. So let's look at Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Aha! So the disciples were not told to go in their own power. They were told to wait. They had to wait. And I wonder what they were thinking as they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Is he really going to come? I could do this. I've got this. I'm smart. I can do this on my own. I wonder what they were thinking while they were waiting. And for us, isn't it hard to wait and hard to be instructed at times? Because, especially, you know, especially when we're passionate about something, we want to go and we're so, we think we're so smart and we have so much knowledge and maybe we've been Christian for a really long time and we know the word really well and we want to impart our knowledge on people. So uh, that doesn't always go very well in our own, pow- in our own power. But the, the really exciting part is that God is just waiting to use, use us when we give over the reins to him. He wants to use us as channels of his power, and he wants us to boldly proclaim the gospel. That's the plan. Our work will be in vain, though, if we work on our own power. However, if we're working in the power of the Spirit, we will do the work, and we just need to love. Like I mentioned before, you go in love, it's the power of the Spirit, no other motive, and he's going to use you, without a doubt. If you submit to that, he is going to use you. The work of advancing God's kingdom has and always will be based on his power. And thank goodness for that. And um, if we're connected to him, we won't be unsure. We 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 won't be wondering, should we go or not? we will be compelled to go because of our connection to him. We will be compelled to go, and he will lead us where and how we should go. So we are a member of the Christian Missionary Alliance. I I mentioned it earlier when I was talking about missions. And I just wanted to highlight the vision of the CNMA. As a denomination, you know, nationally, our vision is to be Christ-centered, eyes focused on Jesus, empowered, spirit-empowered, not our own power, power of the Spirit, and mission-focused, focused focused on the Great Commission. Let that sink in. That is so, like, that that is an amazing vision statement. And if you can just let that sink in, if that guided, you know, if that guided 10% of our day, boy, we'd be in a good place, right? So um, Christ-centered, Spirit-empowered, and mission-focused. And this denomination was built on the foundational command to go and make disciples. Um, And has been so since the 1800s. A.B. Simpson said, this is a quote about the, the, the denomination, that the CNMA aims to reach the most neglected fields, to avoid the beaten tracks of other laborers, to press on to the regions beyond, and instead of building upon another man's foundation, to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. So his heart was for people that were completely unreached, the unreached groups that need to be reached before the end can come. So our churches send people to live on mission as international workers. Uh, There's about at least 250, according to what I found on the website, and more than 40% are in countries where access to traditional missionaries was cut off long ago. Uh, And this fall, we will be hearing from several international workers. I'm not going to name them because I'm being recorded, and for their safety and the safety of the people that they serve, um, I won't share their names, but we will be, we'll have the opportunity to hear firsthand about the work of these uh, international workers uh, ministering to these least reached uh, people groups. So I've talked about our denomination and the role of international workers and short-term missions trips and, and even us as a church, but what about us as individuals, you know, individual children of the king? 
How do we get the power of the Holy Spirit to go? Let's look at the parable of the ten bridesmaids uh, taken from Matthew 25. Um, This parable has just uh, been very revealing to me personally and thought that I would share it with you today um, because it's been, uh, has so much impact on me personally. So I'm going to paraphrase that the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet for the bridegroom. So ten bridesmaids out in the dark, holding their lamps, waiting in the night. Five of them were called foolish and five were called wise. The five who were foolish didn't have enough oil. They didn't have any extra oil to, uh, to light their lamp. But the, the ones that were wise had extra oil to take along in their jars. So five had lots of oil. Five had just enough to be there, but no, nothing extra. So we buy oil. We get oil when we spend time in the presence of God. Oil is a representation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When we spend time with our Creator in His presence, He will fill us with oil. He will fill us with His Spirit. So we're prepared. We're ready for the emergencies of life when things get rough and we are anointed. But this process takes time and it actually takes investment. He wants time. He wants you to be filled by His Spirit. And we can't go to those who've made the investment and say, can I have some of your oil? You can't do that. You can't borrow oil. So kids, you can't borrow oil from your parents' faith. Spouses, you know, husbands, you can't get oil from your wife. You need to have that relationship and spend time in his presence to be ready. So we want to be prepared for his return, yes, but we also want to be prepared for the hurdles that life is going to throw us. So in this parable, the foolish bridesmaids are gone. So they've been waiting. Their lamps burn out. They're gone trying to get more oil. The bridegroom comes. The five wise bridesmaids leave, and the door is shut. So the five foolish bridesmaids come, and they're knocking on the door and saying, hey, hey, we're here, we're here. And the bridegroom says, I don't know you. He doesn't say, you haven't been good enough, or you haven't followed enough rules, or you weren't, you know, any, anything from a checkbox. He's saying, I don't recognize you. I don't know you. So this is really spoke to me that Jesus wants to know me personally. He doesn't want what I can bring to him. He wants to know me personally. He wants to be in communion with you. And in regular language, that means he wants to hang out with you. He wants to spend time with you. Um, He wants you to bring him your worship. Um, That could be here, but that could be in your car or at home. He wants you to bring your struggles and your fears and the tough stuff and your doubts and just lay it at the foot of the cross. He wants to wrestle with, he wants you to wrestle those, that difficult stuff with him. And ultimately, he wants to listen, but he wants to speak to you. And in his presence, there's that back and forth of you being able to share what's going on in your life and ask for help, and then he is going to meet you there. He is going to speak to you. And um, he just wants your time and your focus and your attention. And that doesn't mean a rigid schedule of, I must do my devotions, I've been such a bad Christian, I I hear this all the time, I'm not getting into the Word, I'm not doing my devotions like I should be, and and it just feels like, you know, just not doing the work. And um, he wants you to be doing those things, but compelled out of relationship. Uh, Someone told me once, start with five minutes of quiet and listen. Start with five minutes of quiet and listen to, uh, to see what you can hear and just be praising him in that five minutes, and that will grow. You will start to love that time. Uh, Sean and I have become more involved with small groups in the last few years, and um, these groups have been an amazing opportunity for me personally to go deeper, to build relationships with others, but also to to just study um, some of these topics a a little in in community. And so one of the main topics that we studied... uh, we studied and we practiced together as a group was learning to walk by the Spirit. 
and, uh, and learning how to hear his voice. And we, it, what's cool about doing it in a group is that you, le- you learn that everyone does this a little bit differently. We weren't, we weren't created the same. So we all have different ways of spending time with him and where it works best. And, you know, some people say, oh, I have to be in nature. And other people say, I need complete quiet. And some people say, I need worship music on. Or I need whatever it may be. You need to figure out where you can find, you know, etch out that time and spend time in his presence. And then it, it will actually grow from there. And the main thread, however, amongst everyone in the group was no matter where they sort of were practicing spending time in his presence was you need to quiet distractions and you just need more quiet and you need to shift your attention to him. It's, it's really a, an internal just shifting your focus to him. And I would encourage you, if you're interested at all about learning more about the deeper life you know, that we hear about as a foundation to the Alliance, or, or just learning how to walk more closely in your faith journey, you know, to speak to Pastor Chris, or join a small group that might be covering that topic, because it will change your life. It will transform you um, to learn how to hear his voice. So God is moving around the world today like never before, and it's exciting, and I, we th- think we all want to be a part of it. And he's preparing the world and us for his return. So let's prepare by learning how to stock stock up on oil so we're ready to go when he calls us. So at this time, I'm going to invite up the band for the closing song. And I'm going to recap sort of my points from today. So the first, God is building his kingdom. Do you trust that he is in control? That he's got this? That you don't have to worry about it or shape how that's going to happen exactly? Do you pray and yearn for the kingdom to come? You know, when we say the Lord's Prayer, I hope you think about that differently now, that we pray for the kingdom to come. And you can pray that in your own life. Father, I want your kingdom to come in my own life. I want your kingdom to come in my family, in my home, in my school, in my community, in my country. You, that's, just, that's something you can just pray at any time. So to remember that you are part of the plan for him to build his kingdom. Have you considered how you might already be being used? You know, he has you where you are for a reason. And don't take that for granted. Think about your neighbors. Think about people that you come in contact with. Uh, pray for an open door. Pray for uh, wisdom and, and how he might use you. Are you open to go beyond your comfort zone? You know, I'm willing, we're all willing to go and talk to people with similar faith background. It's not too hard to talk about Christianity or your faith here. Are you ready to be stretched beyond your comfort zone in other places? Are you willing to respond and go where he might call you? And that might not be Guinea, Africa, but that might be to lead a small group. It might be to go and... Talk to your neighbor. You don't know what that's going to be, but are you open to be stretched beyond your comfort zone? And lastly, and probably most importantly, you can't go alone. Uh, When you try, (laughs) it probably won't work. And thank goodness our God is a gracious God that, you know, will pick us up when we we try and it it doesn't work. And then we we come back and say, oh, you know, Lord, help me. And I I don't want to go by my own power. And uh, a challenge today, how do you refill your lamp so that you're prepared with oil when um, the tough stuff in life happens? And uh, do you have enough oil to sustain you to the return of the king? And he, he just wants your time, and he just wants you. Thank you.